Welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about stuff this week on the show. It is a Nintendo Direct focused episode because we weren't actually sure if there was going to be a Weekly Stuff Podcast this week. We're hard at work putting uh, the finishing touches on Japanimation Station Season 2, which premieres this Tuesday, February 14th, Valentine's Day on YouTube. Talk about that more in a second. Uh, so we were going to be recording, but then Nintendo did a surprised Nintendo Direct that was one of the most substantive events like they've done in years, mm -hmm. um, including Shadow Drops, like eight games and demos. So uh, there's a lot to talk about there. So that's going to be the main substance of today's Weekly Stuff podcast. Yes, and I, I did actually um, watch this. Well, I kind of half watched it. I watched the Japanese version when I was like half taking a nap. So I kind of had it on <laughs> in the background, but there was enough stuff that like, I remembered most of it, so... Nice. Yeah. Well, that is that is what we're going to be doing today. Uh, but yes, in terms of housekeeping, I want to quickly remind everyone that yes, Japanimation Station Season 2, which is called UFO Table Moon Works, because we are reviewing, discussing all of the UFO Table, which is an anime studio adaptations of Type Moon, which is a video game slash visual novel studio. Uh, their stories, such as Kara no Kyokai, The Garden of Sinners, Fate Stay Night... All of that good stuff. Um, it's a really good season. It's starting this Tuesday, Valentine's Day, 7 p.m. on YouTube is the premiere. It'll uh, then go out to all podcast platforms, midnight, um, wide, everywhere. So that's technically midnight Wednesday, but Wednesday morning. Um, so go find it wherever you find your podcasts. We are so excited. This is a great, great season. It's going to be airing all in a row, 13 episodes, lots of good stuff to come. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, we've we've recorded almost all of it. We're we're right at the end of the recordings, and it's it is nice that they're going to start coming out because I do feel like my brain has been melting recording <laughs> the the weekly stuff podcast because it's like all the continuity of the podcast feels like it's slightly shifted because the Jonathan on this podcast knows a lot more about a lot of stuff than uh, that anybody listening knows. Yes, so like for instance, my brother Thomas. Uh, just started watching Fate Zero because I'd been recommending it. And he watched the first episode and I was like, oh yeah, our podcast on that is good. It gives a lot of context. And I went, I have it. I can just send that to Thomas. That's He can listen yes. to that because he, I know him. He can have it. And I sent it over to him. And I was listening to part of it again. And I'm talking in that episode a little bit about watching episodes of what we're watching on the plane out to Portland. And I'm like, oh my God, that was my Christmas break. And this was recorded before. I like This is a different Jonathan recording these. So it is weird. We have never stocked up episodes quite like this. A little bit with the 10th anniversary podcast. But that was a different kind of thing altogether. Because those all wound up airing in one giant stupid 10 hour episode yes and, and and there's not like the there's a whole sort of meta podcast narrative i feel like that builds up over this course of japanimation station <laughs> where you know it's the same kind of thing as weekly suit gundam where you started with basically no knowledge or experience with any of this stuff and then now you you're like one movie basically away from being from being done with it uh, yeah. So it is. Yeah, it's a it's a fun journey to go on for people who either if you're like me and you're already deep into the type moon stuff and you read Fate Stay Night and you're just like crazy about all that stuff. That's fun. But I think also if you're someone who is like Jonathan was at the beginning of the season and you didn't you have no idea what any of that stuff is. All of it's basically on Crunchyroll with the exception of the last three movies. But those are also easy to, to find. Um, and if you want to follow along with that, I think that is a good way to watch it, too. Yep, and we did a little preview episode. It was in this feed. It was in the Japanimation Station feed where we tell you where to find everything. Again, it's pretty simple. It's Crunchyroll. Um, so there you go. Uh, but that'll be premiering Valentine's Day. Very excited for that. Uh, Sean, do you have any stuff before we dive into the news? 
I mean, my my only stuff is, is the perfect example of what I mean is it's, it melts my brain to try to talk about the stuff on the podcast, which is I have finished part one of the Tsukihime remake, um, which I don't know how, like how to talk about that because obviously <laughs> that is that is a Type Moon visual novel. It is a remake of the original Type Moon visual novel. Um, it is only available in Japanese. Hopefully one day that gets localized, um, like Witch on the Holy Night was. Um, maybe when they do part two, whenever that comes out, which I hope is not an insane amount of time in the future. Um, but it's fucking amazing. Um, yeah, Tsukihime is uh, fantastic. If, uh, it would be much easier for people to play the original version of the game, obviously, because that has been translated into English forever ago. Um, but it is a fantastic story um, that is also like... You know, if if it was feasible to do double features for video games, you know, the way you can for movies with video games is kind of impossible when they're like 100 hours long. But it would make a, dub, a great double feature with Persona 3 because they're both very much interested in the same ideas of like mortality and what does it mean to like live a life in the face of death because the main character of Tsukihime, much like the main character of Kata no Kyokai or one of the main characters um, for people who are going to start watching that can see death in the world as these lines and can activate the death in both objects and like living things like people by tracing those lines. Um, and so he had, and it's kind of, um, for Tsukihime in particular, it's a pretty horrifying power for this kid who's a otherwise a very normal person to have. Um, because if you can imagine if you're trying to have a conversation with a person and you saw sort of these weird red lines all over them and you knew in your head, if you reached out and touched those, this person would just fucking drop into pieces because you have magically activated their death. Um, and he has this power in that game because as a kid, he basically had a near death experience where he effectively died and was miraculously brought back to life. And that is why he has this power. And so he's like symbolically carrying death with him everywhere in a very similar way as the protagonist in Persona 3. Um, and then the fun part of Tsukihime is then it's also a vampire story. So that's where it intersects with this idea of um, death and life is that then one of the main characters, Arquaid, um, who's a vampire, is obviously immortal and she can live forever. Um, and so like those different experiences of immortality and mortality and how they intersect in the relationship between those two characters is kind of the spine of part one of the remake, which is the first half of the original game. Uh, and it's fucking awesome. Um, and I, I very much want to now play the original game. I'll probably wait a while to do it um, because I've, I've spent almost exactly a month when I looked at the save file. Um, but I was just curious, what was my first save file? And I think it was January like 13th or 14th. So it's like I've spent almost exactly a month basically just playing through the Tsukihime remake. So I need to take a little bit of a break on visual novels for a bit. Um, but it is it is a great story, and if people can read Japanese and are interested, I, it gets a very very high recommendation for me. Nice, yeah. I I very very much hope that gets a localization, uh, in the vein of Witch on the Holy Night. So just praying praying every night to the to the lords above that we get that. Yes, or at least make a make a movie or an animated season. We can we can add some episodes onto Ufa Table <laughs> Moonworks someday if they. Do because did, they did Ufa Table did all the um like the opening movies that play at the beginning of each route. There's like two different opening like kind of like an opening for an anime and Ufa Table animated those. So you know, go 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 do a really big version of that and that would be cool too. <laughs> yeah, little little ask, uh, Ufa Table just you finished Fate Stay Night. Go do all of Tsukihime. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, that's cool. Uh, most of my stuff is related to this week's Nintendo Direct. But I did finish Fire Emblem Engage this week after about 70 hours. I played a shit ton of that game, but I also blew through it in like two weeks. So that was a maybe unhealthy amount of Fire Emblem to binge in that amount of time. But man, Fire Emblem Engage is, is fantastic. I think it, uh, particularly the home stretch, the last like five or six chapters, the story, which I enjoyed the whole way through, but I would have called, I think, a fairly basic sort of almost like pre-awakening Fire Emblem story. Um, and I think it works on that level very well. It, in those final chapters, like levels up in a degree that I didn't quite anticipate. And I think it has more on its mind than you would expect at the very beginning. It has a lot of really interesting thematic content about, um, particularly just the idea of sort of family 
And, you know, it's a, it's a story very much about found families. And you, you learn this over the course of the game, that it's not just about, you know, this protagonist getting all his units together, but there's also a whole sort of backstory about uh, him and the people you sort of think are his family at the beginning and the way this all comes together. And I think it does those themes and it has some sort of, like, light, but I think very resonant themes about abuse and cycles of abuse and getting out of that that are like surprisingly resonant and i think a lot of like the cutscenes and the presentation is so good that it's a more narratively ambitious and engaging game than i would have anticipated at the very start you know its ambitions are a lot simpler than fire emblem three houses but i found it like vastly more narratively and thematically resonant in part because this is a single route game that doesn't have like four stories that each take 70 hours to play and there is no like true ending that ties it all together this is just one you know story back to front but it is done tremendously well there's just so many amazing game mechanics i would have to do an entire podcast segment to break down how sort of deep and interesting the tactic stuff becomes in this game because of the entire engage system with the what they call emblems in this game which is the characters you can summon from past fire emblem games which is the deeper you get into it the more it's like oh this is just exactly the rules from fate's day night this is like exactly how the servants are described it had to have been influenced by that because it's even at some point you get to like we're not actually the characters from history we are like a servant that the universe summoned and i'm like yep yep that's exactly it uh and it's very funny but i love all of that and yeah, so it's a it's a very rich game. They give you so many tools to play with that I am definitely at some point wanting to play this game on the highest difficulty. I played it on hard. There's three. There's normal, hard, and maddening. And this one feels like it would be very rewarding to kind of push yourself all the way up to the wall on because there's just so many tools at your disposal. So it's a great game. I loved it. Uh, you know, there are a lot of games this year that will be challenging it for my number one spot because 2023, as we talked about last week, is pretty stacked, but this is definitely going to be in, in contention on, on that scale for the rest of the year. Cause this is a, a great game that is obviously right up my alley as a Fire Emblem fan. But I think even if you're new to this kind of game, it's incredibly rewarding. And the stuff with the, the emblems and the characters from past games is like fun and rewarding if you know those characters although i think very few players will know all of them especially in america because a lot of these games have never been localized uh but even if i think you knew none of them the game it's it's not narratively such a part of it that like you have to know marth's backstory from shadow dragon and the blade of light to to get it and enjoy it there's plenty else here so it's really great awesome yeah i do have one other piece of stuff sean uh, which is Thomas, my brother, texted me the other day and said, I have a story for you to share with Sean. It'll make him jealous. And I was okay. like, yeah, what's this? And so it turned out to be about Genshin Impact. So okay. this was the other day when the new banners went live. He said, so the Hu Tao banner started this afternoon. Mm -hmm. She's my favorite character. And I wanted to get her to C1, which means to get the constellation up to the yeah. get a second Hu Tao. Yeah. Which is very good for Hu Tao because it means that her charged attacks don't take up stamina. Um, so her C1 is really, really good for her. Wow, I actually didn't know that. That's cool. So he says, I had about 68 wishes, but I'm 83 wishes away from pity, and it's soft pity at that, meaning he could get the other five star. Yes. Uh, but I figure I'll give it a try. In only 20 pulls, I got Hu Tao, easily the luckiest I have ever been in Genshin. Now, with gambler's mentality, I eye the weapon banner. The weapon banner being the gambling part of Genshin. Yeah, with the Staff of Homa, which is Hu Tao's uh, designed weapon, which is one of the best spears in the game for her and for Jung Li. Yeah, and so he, he says, the Staff of Homa would be pretty nice, dot, dot, dot. So I give that a try, too. In 30 pulls, I see the glint of gold. It's not the Staff of Homa, though. It's the Aqua Simulacra. He thinks, wow, I've never been so lucky. Perhaps I'll keep trying. With my remaining 20 wishes, I see the glint of gold again and receive my prize, the Staff of Homa. TLDR, I got both weapons on the banner and Hu Tao in 70 wishes. Never even got to pity. And and that the Hu Tao he got is that he already had her. So yes, that he already had one. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very lucky. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've... I th only have, like, the five-star weapons is one of the main, main things in Genshin where I almost never do the weapon banner. Um, I think I have maybe done it enough to get pity once because I did get a five-star weapon from the weapon banner once. Um, but yes, that's incredibly lucky. The weapon banner is, that is the, like, 
that is the black hole. That is the if you are insane, <laughs> you start going to yes. the weapon banner for Genshin. That's the like it like the odds and shit are so against you on that one. Um, but yeah, I I have wanted a see like Hu Tao is one of the only characters that I do actually really want that constellation on because it does seem to make her much more convenient to play because she just wouldn't run out of stamina so much. Um, so every but this time I haven't rolled any on her banner because the uh, three four stars are just like very normal. If there was a couple, there's like oh here's a four star character I don't have all the constellations for. I would definitely go like yeah I'll roll some and if I end up getting C one Hu Tao, awesome. Um, but yeah, I have I have used the weapon banner once I think ever, and it was a I did one ten pull, and that was around the time that. Uh, Oh, gosh, I haven't played Genshin in a while, and I'm forgetting names. But it is the uh, mermaid girl who. Oh, uh, Kokomi. Yeah, Kokomi. Sorry, I'm forget. I'm forgetting the name of like the best character in the game. I'm sorry, yes. Kokomi. Um, and it was when I, I got Kokomi, and her banner was up in the weapons too. And I did like one ten pull and got her five star weapon. Oh, nice. Uh, and that's the. And I've just never touched it again. I've been like, just I did it once. I got one of the best weapons. I'm done. And that's why Kokomi has always been like a main on my team, is because from the beginning I had her best weapon and everything. So yeah. Uh, but that was like my one time engaging with that system, and I was like, I'm not gonna push my luck. That is, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> yeah. The main reason I ended up pulling a bit on the the weapon banner because I ended up getting the one I got was Nilo when they added her. I got her sword. But I mostly was pulling on the weapon banner because they added new four stars when they added in Sumeru. Um, so I was like, oh, if I can get some of those four star weapons, that's cool. Um, then I ended up getting her sword, but I'm pretty sure that was on pity because I had done it a couple of times over the like three years I've been playing that game. But yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, anyway, that's your little uh, Genshin story. Uh, yeah, Genshin's Thomas. really good. And Hu Tao <laughs> has a really good uh, thing where she raps um, in the, the uh, Lantern Rite Festival that just ended. And it's yeah, fucking amazing. It is. All right. Well, then, any in any case, you want to talk about the news? What's going on in the news, Jonathan? Uh, mostly Nintendo stuff for this week. Um, we're going to talk about the surprise Nintendo Direct from February eighth. That was this Thursday or uh, Wednesday, and yeah, it's uh, it was a big one. It started out kind of slow, and then it was just like we're just going to drop. <laughs> A ton of shit on you. So this wound up being pretty cool. So let's go through this in order. First thing we saw was Pikmin 4. Um, looked very pleasant. It had, it kind of looked like they were going to Earth. I don't know, I don't know enough Pikmin lore. It looked like it was supposed to be Earth. It has all these sort of overgrown settings that look like, I guess I'm calling this pleasant post-apocalyptic, which is the same aesthetic as Kirby and the Forgotten Land. So I kind of like Nintendo being like, what if The Last of Us, but nice, pleasant, no one no one has to die. Uh, and that's what it looks like. Everything's very miniature. You have a big yellow dog. He looks like a good boy. I didn't see Olimar or any of the characters I know from Pikmin. Uh, but again, I don't know the lore well enough. That is coming out July 21st, 2023, which also made me realize, Sean, Pikmin 2 was 2004. And mm -hmm. Pikmin 3 felt like so long after that. That was 2013 on the Wii U. This is 2023 now. So it is actually a longer gap between three and four than between two and three, which makes me feel old as shit. Yes, that that, that is weird to think about because it does feel like Pikmin 3 wasn't that long ago. Although I do think it's that thing of where, you know, people wanted a new Pikmin game for a really long time. And then maybe partially because it came out on the Wii U. But I feel like Pikmin 3 came out and it just came and went and nobody really kind of paid much attention to that game. Um, so hopefully maybe Pikmin 4 being on the Switch can, can attract a bigger audience to the franchise. Because I, I was surprised when I watched the trailer how much, it just, it's like, it's fucking Pikmin. Like, it doesn't seem, I played <laughs> Pikmin 1. That's the only Pikmin game I've played. Um, and I definitely never finished it because I just rented it from Blockbuster. Because that's how old Pikmin is. is that I was the same way. Yep. <laughs> um, and I, I was kind of shocked. It was like, yeah, that's just fucking, that's exactly what Pikmin is. Um, it is weird or I guess it kind of makes sense that that franchise has, doesn't seem to have changed in a really huge way in the like 20 plus years it's been since it first came out. It's uh, it's wild. You know, Shigeru Miyamoto 
This is his passion project. He makes it happen. Uh, apparently, I was looking at this up. He had started talking about Pikmin 4 in interviews in 2015, saying that they were getting started working on it. And in interviews with him over the years, it sounds like it kind of went on and off in development because this is all in-house. This is a Nintendo mm-hmm. EPD. And it sounds like this, like, he literally in one interview said, we're still working on it, but it's on the back burner now. And I was like, this is fascinating. I wonder if Pikmin 4 has just been, like, off and on. There's a little office where people go work on Pikmin 4 for 10 years, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But anyway, that is coming. I am curious about that. So there you go. Uh, Shinya Takahashi was up to host, as always. Uh, first batch of headlines. Go through some of these fast. We have a Xenoblade 3 expansion coming. Volume 3 of that expansion pass is February 15th. We have Samba de Amigo Party Central coming summer 2023. Is that Has there been a Samba de Amigo game recently, or is that pretty... I'm pretty sure that it has been a long time since a Samba de Amigo. I'm going to type Samba de Amigo into Wikipedia and see uh, what comes up. I mean, it didn't. a franchise page did not come up. Um, the lo- latest thing seems to be that there was... A Wii version, uh, yes, there was a Wii version, and I think that is the last Samba de Amigo game was on the Wii. Wow, because I definitely saw that people were the people who are Samba de Amigo fans were excited about this. So there you go. If you're into Samba de Amigo, it's coming back. There was a fashion game that I'm mentioning mainly. It's called Fashion Dreamer, but they said you're trying to become a stylish influencer. I think is the portmanteau they used, like stylish influencer so like stylish influencer uh but i had a small stroke hearing that word and blacked out so i don't know if i had it right that word maybe broke my brain well i again i was watching the japanese stream of this which has a couple of narrators one of them is nakamura yuchi it's one of the main reasons i end up watching some of the stuff on the japanese youtube channel um and there was something like upsetting about realizing that the word influencer has come over to japan because they use that word (laughs) in no japanese english basically uh, all over the trailer for this game, and it was upsetting to me. Yeah, like, I'm going to ruin, you know, Sean, I'm yeah. going to ruin something you love. Are VTubers influencers? Uh, they can be. Um, okay. If they're, if they're given, like, a, you know, if they're asked by a company to promote a specific product or game, then yes. In that instance, they would be an influencer. Okay, so that's what influencer means to you. Yes. All right. Yeah, I don't. I don't know is, what it means. It is pain. Other than I think. I think yes. if you're just doing it on your own, <laughs> like you're. I don't know. Maybe you can consider yourself an amateur influencer. But I think, for my mind, the line between you are an online personality and you are an influencer is you are an influencer. You are being hired by a marketing company to market those products. That is that what an actual influencer is. So influencers are shills. So we're yes. not influencers. No. Yet. Well, one day. One day. God, I want that money. Yeah, I'm, uh, no. I'm waiting for that call type moon. You know, if you yep. want to sponsor a season two Japan animation station, you know, it's, you can still get in. Yep. Uh, all right. Then this was kind of cool. Dead Cells, uh, which is the sort of modern uh, Metroidvania game, is getting a Castlevania uh, expansion pack called Dead Cells Return to Castlevania. It's got Richter and Simon Belmont playable. It's got the Vampire Killer and a bunch of the other weapons. It's got 12 original cover songs and 51 songs taken from Castlevania games. Looked actually pretty cool. I've never played Dead Cells. I know it's supposed to be really good. This basically just looks like a new Castlevania game in Dead Cells, uh, which sounds cool. It also makes me realize how sad it is that Konami is just sort of sitting on that license. They've done some good releases of old Castlevanias, but like Give Castlevania to a cool developer. Come on, let's let's get some new Castlevania. Yeah, I had the exact same thought of where I had that realization of like, oh, when was the last time they made a Castlevania game? Because um, it has been a very long time. I mean, they've done lots of re-releases, but yes. um, it would be nice if they made a new one. I also have to publicly shame you here, Jonathan, because I'm looking at your notes and you misspelled Belmont. You spelled it with two L's and Belmont only has one L. And I'm, I'm personally offended. It's possible that was autocorrect. I, I don't give a shit, you know, you should have caught it, you know, that's on you, you know, if, if someone sends me an email and it's full of spelling errors, I'm just like, oh, well, they autocorrect fucked up, I was like, no, you fucked up, you gotta check that shit, that's no excuse. I, I apologize to the Belmont family, I will be making reparations uh, in the form of playing Castlevania games, uh, this will be coming I have out fixed March it for you. Okay, thank you. This will be coming out March 6th. Uh, We saw a narrative puzzle adventure, Tron Identity. It is a Tron visual novel kind of thing. Why? Why in 2023? Is there a new Tron? I have no idea what the fuck this is. This was not in the Japanese (laughs) 
I, this is either not coming to Japan or they did not think it was worth marketing on the Japanese Nintendo Direct because this was not in that. Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, ghost Trick Phantom Detective. I don't know what that game is, but it's getting an HD remaster. So if there's any Ghost Trick fans, that's coming I, back. I want to say Ghost Trick was a DS game. Was that a that 3DS sounds game? right? Yeah, it was a it was a DS game from 2010. Um, okay. Yeah. So I know people really liked Ghost Trick. It was that thing of like when I saw the like images of it on the screen, like a dead brain cell in the back of my brain like activated is like oh my god right that's a game that came out i remember people really liking that it's like kind of a cult hit that's like 2010 so yeah that's that's a while ago that okay that's cool that's nice that that's coming back uh we've got that we've got deca police which is a level five game uh that's a big 3d uh sort of jrpg kind of thing with uh the deca police but that actually was a nice little trailer uh bayonetta origins cereza and the lost demon i had not um looked into this game much before so this was my first time seeing it kind of at length and this is kind of an interesting game it's completely unlike bayonetta you're controlling both cereza who is young bayonetta and the demon cheshire who's this like big you know cat beast and cereza can't do any attacks but can magically sort of like bind enemies and do puzzle solving and then cheshire does all the attacking but you're controlling both of them at the same time and it's kind of in this isometric view, very nice art. Looks pretty cool. I was a little thrown back by this is a full $60 game. This looks like it would be like a $20 eShop mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, it is a full $60 game. It's coming in March, I believe. Um, does look kind of cool, though. I, I might wait for reviews on that one, but I like the pitch of this thing. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's got a nice uh, look to it. You know, the visual style's nice. Yeah. Then we got a look at some Splatoon 3 DLC, and this is one of the weirdest DLC announcements I've ever seen. It is a two-wave DLC. Wave 2, we got just a very brief cinematic trailer for something called Side Order. It looked like it had a squid kid wandering in this new area mm -hmm. that looked to me like the underground world from Nier Automata, where like everything goes black and white and you're down in like the buried city. Um... I'm assuming this is a new campaign in the same way the Octo expansion was for Splatoon 2. And if so, that'll probably be pretty good. But they did, we didn't get any details on it. And then the Wave 1 of the expansion, which is coming sooner in this spring, they said, is Inkopolis, which is the town, the hub world from the original Splatoon on Wii U. Um, but it's just, it's an alternate hub world you can use. So if you go in and play Splatoon 3, you can use the hub world that's in Splatoon 3, or you can use the hub world from Splatoon 1, but it's the same weapon, same gear, same... The shopkeepers and everyone are kind of taken from the Wii U game. So it's no new content, it's no new weapons or gear or anything. It's just a new place to, like, hang out in between matches, which I think is a weird thing for paid DLC. Obviously, Splatoon mm -hmm. is odd to begin with because all the multiplayer stuff is free DLC. They never do anything paid for that because they kind of keep everyone in parody. Um... But yeah, this is half of the DLC is is just an alternate hub world. I've never seen a DLC like that. Yeah, I'm glad that you're explaining here because when I watched it, I had fucking no idea what the hell they were talking about. And partially that's because it was in Japanese. And so I was like not paying full attention. And then there and I didn't know what any of the proper nouns in fucking Splatoon are. So I was just like, <laughs> what are they trying to sell here? Like, what is it? I was like trying to figure out, is it a multiplayer map? Is it like a big explorable area? And then I slowly just like, no, but it's like they keep on talking about like it being nostalgic. And it's like, is this from like the first game? And it was, I had no fucking clue what the hell they're trying to sell. And now I understand why, because it is a weird thing to try to sell. Like it's, I feel like you're kind of desperate to sort of pitch this thing um, because it is it it feels like a cool thing that would be nice as a free bonus of like oh hey we put in the hub world from the old Splatoon games um, but yeah asking someone to pay money for that seems weird yeah especially because I mean just like look at the numbers Splatoon one actually sold pretty good for the Wii U it sold almost five million copies but Splatoon two and three have both sold in the like fifteen million plus range. So you're mm -hmm. talking about, like, the people who remember Inkopolis enough to be nostalgic for this is a fraction of the audience. It's like one in five players, it, which is very funny to me, but oh well. Um, it's a, really, I feel like that's more of a bonus for whatever this side order thing is. Uh, I do like the idea of this being Splatoon meets Nier Automata, because that would make me laugh very hard. 
Yeah, I do find it interesting that like because there's quite a bit of DLC stuff that was in this Nintendo Direct. Like we kind of went past that scene of Blade Three One because neither of us played that game. But I do like it is as someone on the outside is a little bit confusing to me when they say like this is like part one of wave two of DLC. Like there, it feels like Nintendo has their own verbiage for how they organize their DLC, but like it makes it hard to follow what exactly are you talking about? Like as someone who doesn't know and hasn't played that game, like is this part of like, is this part two of one big DLC thing you already bought? Is this a separate purchase? Yeah. Um, it's like very confusing. I can tell you because I'm in the Nintendo world. Basically how Nintendo first party games virtually always do DLC is that there it is a season pass kind of thing. And it is one, it's usually they call it an expansion pass, and it's one thing you buy, and then there are waves of it over time. So I think the first thing they really did this with was Breath of the Wild back in the day, which had a two-part sort of thing where there was some stuff put in the game, and then the second part was the Champions Ballad DLC, which was added later. But you just bought one pack, and you got that over time, but they gave you sort of a broad outline early on what those parts would be. And basically, that's what they've been doing ever since. Um, Fire Emblem was one of their first series to really experiment with DLC back on the 3DS, and that one had more of an episodic, like, buy it one piece at a time. Since then, they've streamlined that as well into being single sort of packs. Pokemon uh, Sword and Shield did this. Xenoblade does this. So pretty much just, like, for future reference, anytime there is, like, DLC, paid, paid DLC for a Nintendo game, it is a pass, it's like a season pass, and you get stuff over time in waves, and that's where all the verbiage comes from. Same as, like, the Mario Kart 8 thing that is ongoing you cannot buy those piecemeal it's just okay. a single expansion pass interesting yeah so you got that uh more headlines disney's illusion island uh which is i guess this is a like sequel to like an old super nes game right it's like disney's castle yeah, of illusions I think it's, or... yeah like a, a spiritual sequel kind of thing right um yeah obviously yeah, yeah, there were made... a few of those mickey mouse platformers on the snes and the genesis back in the day Yes, so, um, but that one is is coming out for Switch uh, in July. They said July 28th. The art in it is really nice. I thought in the cutscenes, I was like, oh, wow, everyone looks weird as shit. Um, but then I think you see it in the gameplay, and it's an interesting visual style that harkens back more to, like, a Steamboat Willie version of Mickey Mouse than sort of his modern appearances. And it does look fun. I, uh, I know people love some of those old Mickey platformers, so we'll mm -hmm. see. Uh, but that is coming out. Uh, they announced, they detailed the subsequent waves of the Fire Emblem Engage DLC. So this is what we were just talking about. Um, and the way the Fire Emblem Engage DLC, because Wave 1 came out on day one. And so I did pick up the season pass. It's $30 and there's going to be four waves overall. And it's actually really good. Fire Emblem DLC has been really hit and miss. This one is pretty cool. So Wave 1, you got two new emblem characters and you had maps to unlock them as well. Um, and that was Tiki and then the three heroes from three houses all in sort of one ring, which is a cool mechanic. And so because they're emblem characters, you not only get a map to play where you unlock them, you also then can use them in any battle and assign them and do they're fully integrated into the game. Uh, wave two, they will add Hector, the emblem of strength. I, he's from the Fire Emblem GBA game. So mm -hmm. remember him, he's uh, the, like the, the best friend character who's in the father. I think of, I think he's Roy's father in the sequel slash prequel game that never it's the blazing blade which we didn't get we got the binding no we got the blazing blade the binding blade is the one we didn't get it's a whole weird thing with fire emblem gba he has uh, a we've... big axe that is what i yes. remember from hector you, yes. you give him a big fucking axe yep hector was great so we're getting him we're getting soren who is from uh he's from the the ike games the gamecube uh and wii games and i actually already played his map because this was a this dropped on the day of the direct and there's a fun little scene where he and ike meet and he's like yay we it's actually very funny you play this whole map where soren is kind of a dick to you and he's like i'm not joining you unless you can beat me in combat and so you have this big hard battle and then at the end of it ike who is one of the emblems comes up and soren's like oh ike if i knew you were here i would have just joined you from the beginning and i was like great fucking ike just hanging out in the background not helping us uh, and you are also getting Camilla, who is from Fire Emblem Fates. She is the giant boob lady who was uh, an online meme when Fire Emblem Fates came out because there's a cutscene where she literally like walks into the camera with her giant boobs and envelops the camera. I, I yeah, that was a character that I recognize <laughs> entirely from that going around on yes. Twitter. 
Uh, so that is Wave 2. Wave 2 dropped on the day of the Direct, so that is already out. Wave 3 will have Krom and Robin from Fire Emblem Awakening within a one uh, unit, and you will also have Veronica, who I guess is a character from Fire Emblem Heroes, the mobile game. I have never played that, but that is where she is from. Wave 4 will be a new story campaign called Fell Xenologue. So it's actually, that's a pretty darn good DLC pass because you get all these new emblems um you get new maps for all of them and then there will be a full new you know mini campaign uh and the one they added for three houses was pretty good so it'll be similar to that and that is coming over the course of this year so there you go that's more fire emblem engage content and then we have a new uh don't nod game called harmony the fall of reverie really beautiful animation um looks like sort of a visual novel adventure game they noted that the celeste composer lena rain did the music and it did indeed have very nice music uh, i know this is visual novi- novel e because they made a point of showing hey there are lots of branching paths and they like showed the diagram of branching paths so if people like that that is coming june 2023 Interesting. This was not in the Japanese Nintendo Direct, so I did not know that. Um, Octopath Traveler 2, they reminded us, is just around the corner. That's coming February 24th. And they did launch a new demo of the game's opening hours, the prologue demo. I believe that allows you to play like three hours of the full game, and then your progress will carry over. Square pretty much always does this for their games now. Um, And so, yes, that is coming. And that is, I will remind people, not just a Nintendo exclusive. I don't know if the demo is on other platforms, but the game itself is also on PS4, PS5, and Xbox. So that is coming February 24th. Um, there is a uh, remaster of the sequel to Katamari Danasi, which is called We Love Katamari. This is We Love Katamari Reroll Plus Royal Reverie. Just make it a mouthful there. Katamari Danasi itself got a uh, remaster called Katamari Danasi Reroll uh, in 2020, I believe. And so this is coming out June 2nd. And there will be a demo of the game for Nintendo Switch Online members from February 20th to February 26th. I've never played the Katamari Damacy games, but I know people love those games. Yeah, it's one of those franchises that, like, I have completely lost track of, like, how many games have they made and which ones have been remastered on which systems because there have been, there's been, it feels like there's so many but it feels like they have not made an actual new one in a long time. But every once in a while, you get like, oh, on mobile, they've made a remaster. I know now they put this yeah. one out on Steam. Um, so, I've, yeah, I've like kind of lost track of that franchise because like you, I've never actually played a Katamari Damashi game. Yeah. And then they showed off uh, some footage of Sea of Stars, which is a new RPG by Sabotage Studio. That is the studio that made The Messenger a couple years ago that was um, kind of an indie hit. That was sort of a Ninja Gaiden riff. This is more of a Chrono Trigger riff. You can, I mean, it, like the battle system and everything is like pure Chrono Trigger. And it even has um, the composer from that game, Yasunori Mitsuda, is a guest composer on this game. And there is a demo also that launched on the eShop today for that. So you can go play a demo of that right now. Um, this is set in the same world as The Messenger, uh, but it is a different genre altogether, which is kind of interesting. I kind of like that they're kind of genre hopping with their games here. I I never played The Messenger, but I know, I'm pretty sure I would love it. It's like Ninja Gaiden meets, and it's kind of a Metroidvania thing as well, uh, which sounds right up my alley. So I should probably play that. And I know some people are excited for this. So that is coming. Um, One of the weirdest announcements was a game called Omega Strikers, which is a free-to-play, what they called online air hockey kind of thing. It looked like an anime sort of styled version of that shitty Mario Party minigame where you have two two versus two and there's a hockey puck in the middle and it like goes around and you can barely control it and it's like basically whoever wins is the person who doesn't throw the puck into their own goal the most times is how that Mario Party game works. But this will be a full free-to-play online game uh, coming April 27th. Yeah, if you video care. game air hockey has never made sense to me. Like, it's no. just like, it, it's not, I've never found a video game version of air hockey fun to play. So I just think there's something about yeah. the thing that makes air hockey fun is like the tactile nature of it and the like real life hand-eye coordination and stuff. Um, whereas the video game is just like, it doesn't take advantage of the things that video games can do well. I don't know, it like kind of just robs air hockey of its inherent fun. Yeah, if you can't hit the puck too hard accidentally and like because you get too competitive and it flies off the machine and you have to go find it and then put it back on the machine, it's not even air hockey, right? Yeah, if you can't just like slide and throw your puck across the whole thing and just like smash it into your opponent's goal, um, just to be an asshole, like it's just what's even the point? 
You know, here is something I never thought we would see, but Etrian Odyssey is coming to Nintendo Switch. This is the Atlas uh, RPG series that was made for Nintendo DS and Nintendo 3DS very literally because these are sort of old school dungeon crawler JRPGs where the top screen is the dungeon and the monsters and all of that and the bottom screen is a map that you have to make by hand. It doesn't map for you. You go in and you use all the tools and you use the stylus to draw the map for yourself. Uh, Persona fans might know the Persona Q games are spinoffs of Etrian Odyssey and use all of those mechanics as well. And that is like such a bespoke DS franchise that I was curious if it would continue in any form post Nintendo DS. And in this case it is, we are getting the origins collection, which is the first three Etrian Odyssey games. Um, and it looked like there were a couple of different ways the mapping would work. In one view they showed us the mapping was just like one half of the screen and the dungeon is the other half. You, it looks like you could also minimize the map and kind of have it in the upper right hand corner. Um, they've done a lot of work on it. There's 24 newly drawn character illustrations, new difficulty options, and also auto mapping, which the original games did not have in case you don't want to deal with the mapping, which is kind of weird because that's what Etrian Odyssey is about. But that is coming June 1st. Each game is being sold separately or there is an $80 bundle. That sounds like a lot, but they are selling each for $40. So I guess if you buy the bundle, you get one of the games for free. Uh, but that is the Etrian Odyssey collection. I'm curious how that will play. And it feels like maybe this is Atlas kind of dipping their toes in the water to see if this franchise can continue with the DS being a thing of the past now. Yeah, that was my sense of it as well, is that this is them sort of just seeing, is there any interest for, like, when can we do it? in like a gameplay sense and two is there any interest for Etrian Odyssey for us to do another game like this that's what this feels like yeah uh, Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp is finally coming out that was the game that got delayed because of the Ukraine invasion uh, ostensibly. It was such a long delay that I'm not sh sure if maybe the other things were going on. But we saw some animated cutscenes that looked very nice. That is coming out April 21st so it seems like it is finally happening this is another uh, thing that interestingly was not in the Japanese Nintendo Direct that did not come up. Huh, interesting. Yeah. I guess that maybe is a more popular franchise over here. I don't... Mm -hmm. Although it started... Advance Wars, before... There were the Wars games on... There yeah. were Famicom Wars and Super Famicom Wars. None of those came to the US. Advance Wars was the first one that did. And it was in that same generation as Fire Emblem because they're both intelligent systems. So I am looking forward to this. I like Advance Wars a lot. Um, Kirby Return to Dreamland Deluxe got a little uh, showcase and this is something cool very similarly to Mario 3D World plus um, Bowser's Revenge was that the name of that game? Yeah, something like that um, this has a new like campaign on top of it so it's the original Wii game plus a new story called Magalore Epilogue which is a new campaign where you play as Magalore who's a character from the main game starts out without any of his powers but then you get magic points defeating enemies and you can restore your powers in any order on kind of a um, skill tree and it has they said 20 stages also has co-op looks pretty substantial so it looks like it's the original Wii game plus an entire sort of like mini campaign on top of that uh, there is a demo of that that also went up after today's direct so you can play that uh, and the full game is out February 24th same day as Octopath Traveler 2 uh, for the Venn diagram of people who are into both things I am one of those people but I assume it's a pretty small Venn diagram yeah I mean they're very they're very different uh, products <laughs> for sure yes I don't think Kirby Return to Dreamland Deluxe is like an 80 hour JRPG but I think they should make an 80 hour Kirby JRPG I'm sure fuck it I'm you kidding. know why not just you know just a really dramatic story Kirby sacrifices himself at the end in order to save the world and kill God <laughs> um, it's crazy I'd play it all right, then this is where we started going into overdrive. We got news about Nintendo Switch Online, and they added both Game Boy and Game Boy Advance. So, uh, Game Boy is it's is an app that it is Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Uh, I think history has come to see the Game Boy Color as essentially an upgrade of the Game Boy, which is correct. Mm -hmm. uh, but so they are in one app together. There is Tetris, the original Game Boy version, Super Mario Land Two, six gold coins. Link's Awakening DX, that's the color version of that game. Gargoyle's Quest, Game & Watch Gallery 3, Alone in the Dark, The New Nightmare, huh. Metroid 2, Return of Samus, Wario Land 3, and Kirby's Dreamland. 
Uh, this is out. They dropped this and GBA both just dropped the day of the direct. That's why I say this is where the whole stream got kind of crazy. Uh, and so I have played this. Um, you have three color uh, schemes that you can use with these games. You have the original Game Boy, which is the piss green thing that you can... I don't know why people still enjoy playing it like that, but if you do, you can play piss green Game Boy. Then there you is gotta Game also Boy. then turn your TV's brightness down to as low as you can <laughs> so that you can barely see it, um, and that's yes. the real Game Boy experience. If you can, like, make out the graphics at all, then you're not... It's not authentic. No. Uh, you have to be, you have to be like, in the corner of your room where the light is and shining it right on the screen to see if you yeah. can see it. Uh, you kids don't know our pain. Uh, then there is the Game Boy Pocket filter, which the Game Boy Pocket is just like the core black and white art without the the green filter. And then the this was exciting for me because this was not ever on the 3DS versions of Game Boy games. It is the Game Boy Color filters. If you never owned a Game Boy Color, uh, the way classic Game Boy games worked is that each game had a default color scheme where colors were applied to the existing code, or you could go around and add like different random color palettes. What they've done here is that the original like default color schemes for all of them are here. They are accounted for, which is really great because some of these games like Metroid 2 um, had really bespoke color palettes that were really cool. Like Metroid 2 on Game Boy Color looks awesome. Um, and so stuff like that, that is all there. Uh, and again, the 3DS never had those versions. It was just black and white or piss green. Um, they also showed off, there are some other games that will be coming soon, including Zelda Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons, the Pokemon trading card game game, mm -hmm. Kirby's Tumble, and some others uh, that are, are coming soon, and they will keep that updated. But yeah, the Game Boy, I will say, the Game Boy Advance app is not as fully featured so far. The Game Boy one, that is a great set of games they launched with. It's a really nice cross-section of games from throughout the Game Boy's lifespan. There's a lot of like classics, like Mario Land 2, Link's Awakening, Kirby's Dream Land, Metroid 2. Um, there's some ones that are sort of like cult classics like I learned Gargoyles Quest is one people love and I played a little bit of it and saw why it's a cool game that's uh, much more popular in Japan because that's the Red Reamer games which that's like a spin-off of Ghosts and Goblins um so yeah. that's like probably okay. why that's in there um because right. that's like much more popular in Japan than it is over here yeah obviously everyone loves Tetris uh Game and Watch Gallery 3 I saw some people making fun of that don't sleep on that the Game and Watch Gallery games were cool because they took the old Game and Watch games put a bunch of them in one cartridge, but they have like different Nintendo characters. It's really colorful. This is a Game Boy Color one, I believe. Um, or it just has a really cool color palette from the original Game Boy. Uh, and they're actually a fun way to engage with the old Game & Watch games. Like they're cool collections. And then Alone in the Dark, The New Nightmare is wild. That's like one of those Game Boy Color ports of an actual console game that's way too ambitious for what it is, but it's actually very entertaining too. I played a little bit of it and you know, it's like text heavy. It's pseudo 3D in places. It's uh, definitely one of those like, yeah, this is the Game Boy Color experience. It's games that were a little too big for their britches uh, trying to do more than they could. I like seeing that. Yeah, there, there was, it never ended up getting finished, but you can find um, a ROM of like the prototype online of a Resident Evil 1 port to Game Boy Color that is like yeah. that. And it's just fucking insane. I will say if you, if you wanted to play some hot Game Boy Mahjong, you can load up the Japanese uh, version of the app because instead of Alone in the Dark, there is a Mahjong game, which when I saw that in the Japanese, I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is going to be the one that they, you know, have a different yes. title in its place in the American version because they, it would be hilarious if they just said, oh, here's Game Boy Mahjong. Um, unfortunately, yes. no Neon Genesis Evangelion Mahjong. I guess they don't want to pay the licensing fee for what has to be the best Mahjong game in history. What would the licensing for that even be? Who is, I wonder who, like, because there's so many weird things with, like, Gainax and Studio Kara uh -huh. and all that, like, how the fuck, that game can never come out again, right? Like, there's yeah. no way that's ever coming out officially. Uh, anyway, um, but yes, this is a good collection. And, you know, I hope we get Mario, I hope we get Wario Land 1 at some point. I hope we get Mario Land 1. I hope we get some of these other things. But just as an initial cross-section of games, this is a good lineup. It's a really good app. Um, it plays very well. I've had fun with this so far. And then for Game Boy, and I should say, the Game Boy, Game Boy Color one is in the base Switch Online, so the $20 a year. It's with those, and that's with NES and Super NES. Game Boy Advance is in the expansion pack that is the $50 a year one with N64 and Genesis. Um, the GBA lineup at launch is 
smaller. It's six games. It's Super Mario Advance 4, which is Super Mario Bros. 3. I think the main reason this one is on here, um, because you can also play Mario 3 on the NES app and on the Super NES app because it's on Mario All-Stars. The reason they have that here is that they've put in all of the exclusive e-reader levels. Uh, if you don't know what the e-reader is, let me date myself. This was a thing you stuck into the top of your Game Boy and scanned little cards that you found in the wild, uh, and then that unlocked content in your Game Boy Advance game. And for Mario Advance 4, there were like it's like 48 levels. It's like a huge Jesus. chunk of game that was e-reader levels exclusive, and you had to collect a ton of e-reader cards to get it. And so this version just has all of them are there in the game unlocked for you to play. So that is there for you. Uh, there's the original WarioWare, absolute classic, a game I had never heard of, but now really like, and I, I learned it's a cult classic called Kuru Kuru Kururin. Uh, Mario Kart Super Circuit, Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, that's a classic, great game. And then The Legend of Zelda, The Minish Cap. So that's a pretty good lineup. It's a little smaller. Um, I think even with the e-reader levels, I would have maybe preferred a different Mario thing because we already have two versions of Mario 3 on Switch, but they're all there. Um, Kuru Kuru Kururin is like this interesting puzzle game where you're this spinning... Um, stick basically going through these levels and you basically the stick sort of spins at a constant rate and you have to guide it through these levels making sure the timing is right it's oh, uh, yeah. deceptively challenging it's very cool and it did have some Jap japan only sequels so i'm hoping those come to like the japanese version of the app because if you don't know you can just get the japanese versions of these apps there's no the region locking to that. Um, so those are available too. Uh, and then they showed off some of the ones that they will be adding, including Metroid Fusion, the original uh, GBA Fire Emblem, F-Zero, Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, all classics. So uh, they better fucking add Metroid Zero Mission is all I can say there. But uh, this is pretty good too. Uh, fewer graphical options because the GBA didn't have as many graphical options. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that launched today. And I've had fun with it so far. And now I have a folder on my Switch of all of the NSO, the Switch Online apps. And because I have always gotten the English and the Japanese versions of each app, it's like my biggest folder on Switch because it's NES, two versions of that, Super NES, N64, Genesis, uh, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance. So that is at least 12 apps now <laughs> if you have the Japanese and the English versions of them. Um, so, you know, it's taken like six years into the Switch's lifespan, but we finally have portable games on the portable console. How much How much money have, would you have spent then at this point since it's been... Because it's like a yearly um, subscription. Yeah. I'm curious. It, it wasn't there in the first year. Yeah. I The expansion pack wasn't until recently, so it was only $20 a year for a while. So that would be like 20, 40, 60 for three years. Um, and actually, I know for two or three of those years, I got a like bundle that was couponed that like really it was like $12 a year for me or something. Um, and then this is the first year I've had the expansion pack and that's 50 a year. So there you go. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's just like it's it's that thing where you it's it's always interesting when you have those subscription services to think back. is like how much if it was a lump sum, how much would you have paid? Yeah. I mean, you know, I would obviously only recommend paying for this if you are into these older games and would enjoy having them on your Switch. Um, and, you know, I I will definitely keep the baseline going forward in part because you also need it to play online games. And mm -hmm. I do play a lot of online games on Switch. And that's only $20 a year. I don't know if like the N64 and GBA stuff will be enough to keep me there. Uh, but we'll see if they keep adding to it. Sure, why not? But there you go. They're running out of, uh, I mean, obviously they can add more games, but they're running out of systems to add. You know, they can throw the yes. Virtual Boy on there. Everyone's, you know, <laughs> chomping at Virtual the Boy with its entire library, all 12 games for but the Virtual Boy. you can only Boy. play it if you bought the VR Labo, which you're, you know, in luck, Jonathan, because you've got that. So, that's... Oh, God. How many people would wind up in the hospital with, like, crippling migraines <laughs> for trying that? Or just, like, their nose smashed in by the switch falling on their fucking face. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, uh, I am happy to have all of that on Switch. And then, right after that, is when the big thing happened. And they showed the original Metroid Prime remastered for Switch. And it launched today digitally, which was, today was February 8th, so several days ago. The physical version is coming out February 22nd, although pre-orders are sold out everywhere for that, so if you wanted it physically, you might be out of luck, uh, but you can buy it on the eShop. It's a $40 
uh, download, and I have been playing the absolute shit out of it. I'm probably a little over halfway through. I, For people who know that game, I just got the gravity suit this morning, and it is a tremendous remaster. It is like the platonic ideal of this kind of remaster. It I is mean, like it's a- technically, a, like, it's really a remake. Like, just, to, like, for, to be clear, like, they, they rebuilt the... It's like a Demon's Soul-style thing where they rebuilt the graphics completely. It is not a, like... They didn't clean up the existing graphics. They right. remade the graphics. But it's but it's very closely in the style. It is not mm-hmm. like the Demon Souls remake in that Demon Souls did a lot of different things with the sure. visuals. Prime is this like it's a dead ringer for a lot of the stuff in the original. Just looking much nicer, cleaned up uh, in sixty fps. Uh, like the only thing that has like piqued my attention of like that doesn't look right is the doors. The, one of the original artists on the game from Retro, who does not work there anymore, flagged this on Twitter saying, hey, this remaster looks great, but the doors are slightly off. Other than that, like it, it is a absolutely beautiful remaster. Everything else is the level geometry, all of that, the physics, everything is the same. It has, uh, it's very definitive in terms of content because it has three control schemes. It has the original GameCube control scheme where you do everything on one stick. It has the Wii controls from Mario, uh, from Mario, from Metroid Prime Trilogy, um, using the gyrometer in the Joy-Con to sort of um, replicate the pointer controls from the the Wii version. And that version, uh, I've played a little bit of it, and it is remarkable how close it gets to the Wii version. Like the physics and like the tensioning of it and everything just feels dead on to how it felt on Wii. The one drawback being, and this is just inevitable due to the technology, is that the Wii, remember, had a an IR blaster on your TV. Mm -hmm. And so you were literally pointing at the center of your television. This is having to recreate with gyro controls. So you do have, there's a dedicated button you use ZR to like kind of recenter yourself. And so it does have to do some calibration. But if you can put up with that, it is a very close replication of the Wii experience. And then there is a new dual stick controls, like a normal uh, FPS. And there's actually some really smart button mapping. There's stuff like if you're playing the dual stick version of it, jump is on the L button. And so you don't have to take your hands off the stick sticks much while you're running around unless you have to like switch visors and stuff. So all of that is there. All of the extras from the Metroid Prime trilogy are there. So the galleries and the soundtracks, and I think they've added some more to that. Um, So it's a very feature complete version of Metroid Prime. It looks absolutely gorgeous. Um, It is probably the best looking game I have played on the Switch's OLED screen because I have the Switch OLED, which I love. And it look like it looks so good that I've preferred to play it on my OLED over my TV because it like the the high contrast and the like nuance of colors. Metroid Prime just is like the game to showcase all of that, and it is fantastic. I, I we could not have asked for a better remaster of this game. Retro did do this in house. They did work with some other studios. Um, one of those studios was Iron. Galaxy Studios, who mm-hmm. did the ports of Skyrim and Diablo 3 for Switch. So they know what they're doing. Those are really good ports. And yeah, it's fantastic. If we get, and I assume we will get Metroid Prime 2 and 3 in this same form, that's amazing. Again, I, I expected we would get Metroid Prime on Switch eventually because it's been rumored so fucking long. I did not expect it to be in this condition. It's a phenomenal version of the game. Yeah, no, it seems it. Yeah, I think it it exceeded everyone's expectations. I mean, the the latest rumors had specifically said that it is a remake, like it is they are remaking the graphics. It is not them using exact like the original game code and cleaning up the resolution and stuff. Um, but yeah, but I think this is even like still more than what people expected, particularly like um, having that more modern control option. Which is nice. That's that thing where you forget um, because the GameCube controller is kind of, uh, a, a, you know, the black sheep <laughs> yes. of that generation of controllers that there are quite a few games that came out on the GameCube that you would expect to have dual analog stick controls, but don't because the weird nubbin that was the C stick did was not good for that kind of thing. Um, so it's nice that they not only did they include that, but they came up with a really good way to include it. Yes. it's Yeah, it's really cool because there are people who still prefer the GameCube controls for Prime, and I'm not one of those people, but I don't think it's crazy. Metroid Prime is a first-person game with shooting, but it is not, like, genre-wise a Mm first-person shooter. It is much more an exploration game, 
And I think that's why some people love the Wii controls. I'm one of those people. I think it's uh, why, like the GameCube version, I think where that would that, where that feels more awkward. This it feels more awkward to me in like GoldenEye than it does in Metroid Prime. Um, but of course, having modern dual stick controls is to me, I think the the best version of it, uh, and that's the main one I've been playing. Um, but again, it's all there, so you can choose, and it is so like historically, also it like preserves mm -hmm. the different versions of the game to play. It's very graphically faithful. I can't imagine anyone being unsatisfied with this version of the game, and they just fucking shadow dropped it at a Nintendo Direct, which is crazy to me. Um, I would imagine, because it has been rumored for so long that they were working on or getting ready to do some kind of, like, port of Metroid Prime to Switch, um, I, I do... Sorry, my phone's making noise. I will edit that out. <laughs> um... What was I saying? I do wonder if now that they've kind of finally pulled the trigger on starting the cycle of Metroid Prime re-releases, if that means that uh, Metroid Prime 4 is closer to being finished. So, we will see. Um... I, I do hope this also portends that we get two and three because those are phenomenal games as well. Yes. I do think like Metroid Prime 4 does feel like it's starting to run out of runway. You know, it's <laughs> like we're getting we're getting within a year to two years of them probably releasing whatever the Switch 2 is going to be. It's like Prime 4 needs to, they need to at least put out a trailer for that game, I guess. Because it has been long enough. It's been like three years since we know that they restarted the development of that game. So it's like, it's been... A very long time since they have actually like done anything with that yeah it's let me look up the exact date because it was 2019 that shinya takahashi made the announcement that retro studios had restarted had taken over development from whoever we think it was bandai namco had been doing it before so that was january 2019 we're now january 20 or we're february 2023 so four so years four that's years. about you know that's a reasonable length of development for a video game, a big video game. But yeah, I would expect that that is probably either never going to happen or sooner rather than later. And, yeah. you know, since we're getting this, hopefully sooner. And uh, please, please, God, finish the trilogy and do the other ones. Because I will say, Sean, replaying Metroid Prime, I love that game to death. I was looking back on last time you and I did our top 10 video games list. Uh, my number one was Persona 3, and I would still say my number one is Persona 3. My number four was Metroid Prime, and I think I had two was Mario 64, and three was just Smash Brothers writ large. I would, I would redo that. I would say Metroid Prime is number two, and I would say, like, those are my top two games of all time. And hey, both have launched on the Switch in the last month, Metroid Prime and Persona 3 Portable. So I'm a, I'm a happy Switch gamer right now. My two favorite games ever are on this system. So there you go. And they and there is a probably not necessarily you know the best version, but a good version of Nier Automata is on that as well. So yes. the actual best game ever is also on Switch for people who are interested. I've been looking into getting that Switch version. Uh, the Digital Foundry analysis showed it's actually a better version of the game than what was like on the base PS4 in terms of some of its um, like stability and stuff. So that's not as good as what you would get on like if you played it on your PS5 or PC today, mm -hmm. but you know um, it's a very solid version of the game. All right. Uh, then uh, I will admit I basically missed the next announcement because I was freaking out about Metroid, but they showed a game called World Detective Organization Rain Code. Didn't really catch what that was. Do you they remember finished... that game earlier in the show called Deca Police? Yes. This would look like it was just exactly that game. I felt like I had I <laughs> like a fucking like weird flashback or something because it's it's they're both of them are like JRPGs themed around sort of like cops but with some sort of like kind of fantasy twist it was like they're so specifically really similar it, i found it very upsetting <laughs> it's like wow yes. it's so specific how are both of these games in one nintendo direct it was kind of weird then they showed this is pretty cool a hd remaster of Baten kaidos one and two these are gamecube uh jrpgs that have a card battling system and uh, they're from the same studio that does Xenoblade Chronicles, and they look pretty cool. I, I did hear from the, like, JRPG contingent of Twitter who love these games, so that is nice that those are coming out in one pack again. Those definitely look interesting to me. Um, Fantasy Life, which was a late 3DS game that I did play a little bit of because it was acclaimed. I didn't wasn't that into it, but it was interesting. That is getting a sequel for Switch called Fantasy Life, The Girl Who Steals Time. So adding time travel into Fantasy Life... 
I did not expect that. Okay, that's kind of like Animal Crossing having a time travel expansion. But whatever, that's fine. All I remember about this is that the Japanese Nintendo Direct, Kaji Yuki, who people would know from like Attack on Titan, did the narration. I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's all I did. Yeah. I associate him with much darker things than fantasy life because of Attack on Titan. <laughs> yes, it was a it was a very refreshing voice style, Kajiki, yes. not him screaming about how they need to murder all the Titans. Yes. Uh, then they had a, this was really just like a CG announcement thing, but they showed a new Professor Layton game, Professor Layton and the World of Steam. I know people freaked the fuck out about this who are Professor Layton fans. Uh, one of those people being Korone, the VTuber. Yes. I did see the clip of her freaking out about new Professor Layton, which was very cute. Um, I've never played one of these games. I know people love Professor Layton and I'm glad you're getting a new one because it's been a while since there's been a genuinely new Layton game, right? Yeah, I know there's I feel been like, remasters and yeah, I feel like yeah. that's the same thing as like a Katamari Damashi where I'm like I don't know where what is the status of this franchise. Um, you know, I've never played them, but I think I really love Layton's character design, and so when he popped up, I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, Professor Layton looks super cool. Um, it's, yeah. yeah, those games seem great. The last new one was in 2017 on 3ds, but that was the one about Layton's like. Daughter, um, the new protagonist. I don't know if it's just a daughter. I just see a girl named Layton, and I'm assuming that. Um, yes, no, it is the daughter. Uh, I think the last one that actually was about Professor Layton himself was like way back in like the early 2010s. There was the Layton versus Phoenix Wright game that also right. came out. Uh, that was 2012. So yeah, this is this is new. It's been a while since there was a new one. Um, so there you go. If you like Professor Layton, that is coming. They, they should have put Professor Layton into Smash Brothers. That's the, the thing I have just now realized. They should have not put in one of those Fire Emblem fuckers and put Professor Layton into Smash Brothers. And now it's too late. And now they have to live with that shame. It's That is too bad. That would be funny. Wave 4 of the Mario Kart DLC is coming this spring. Uh, they showed some new courses, which looked great. and Like, brand new, not redone courses. And then also we are getting Birdo, new character. We didn't know they were going to have new characters. They had not in the other DLC. Uh, Birdo, you know, sub just mysteriously absent from Mario Kart 8 up to now. But now you can play Birdo. You can even make her yellow. That's great. I love Birdo. Birdo is not in enough things. Birdo is weird, but all the perverts love Birdo. Yeah, it blew my mind that she was not already in the game. Like I had to, yeah. obviously I haven't played Mario Kart 8, <laughs> but it's just like, or because you keep on saying Birdo. I had a weird time where it's like I could not remember the English name of the character because they kept because uh, her name is Catherine in Japanese, which I fucking love. I love <laughs> yes. that her name is Catherine so much. And it like memory hold Birdo until you just said it. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's what her name is. Um, I saw a great a guy from Eurogamer did a post about this Nintendo Direct showing this old interview he'd done around the launch of like original Mario Kart 8 on the Wii U with one of the Nintendo producers. And they were talking through a translator and he was saying Birdo and the translator and the guy had no idea who that character was. And so they were scrambling to try to figure it out. And finally, the interviewer had to pull up Birdo on his phone and show it. And they're like, oh, Catherine, Catherine. And they're like, yeah, no, she's not in the game. Um, and I was like, and he was like, you know, 10 years later, justice for Birdo slash Catherine. Uh, it is amazing that Birdo is called Catherine. Yeah, I, and I'm glad that Kathy has made her way into that game. I want a real release of the Atlas game, Catherine, but instead of a human woman, <laughs> it is Birdo, and and you your character is obsessed with Birdo in all no, of her sexy underwear. It's not instead of because right the whole premise of Catherine is that you have there's multiple women named Catherine. Yes, that yes. Like pulled between, and that's like you know they they added that new one with the re-release. They do another re-release and they add in Catherine Birdo, and that's the fourth other heroine. But she's like has no voice. You know, like this, she's not voice actor. She makes like cartoon <laughs> noises or whatever. Um, and it's just Vincent is like seduced, <laughs> seduced by Catherine. <laughs> that would be fucking. Yeah. Put that out of the switch. I think they already have Catherine on the switch, but do a new one on the switch. They do. With, with I own it. <laughs> All right. They did a bunch of quick hits for various games. Uh, the only one I wanted to shout out is a there's a black and white co-op game mm -hmm. called Blanc. That's like you're playing as like two deer in the forest and it's like black and white pencil sketch style. Looks gorgeous. That's coming out this week. Uh, and I'm actually looking forward to that. It's a it's a cheap little indie game. I, I cheap in terms of how much you pay to play it. Not yeah. it looks cheap. Uh, but that looks cool. I, I assume that's coming to more than Switch. But yeah. And then the final segment was a preview for The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Which they are, again, saying is May 12th, 2023. Um, 
We saw uh, a lot of sort of new footage here, new gameplay stuff, including Link driving a giant tractor that looks like it was made by John Deere of Hyrule. And I do like the idea of this just being a farming sim sequel to Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. That would uh, tickle me very much. But no, you see the kingdom getting destroyed, the castle falling apart, the goblins getting corrupted. You see some flying stuff, the islands in the sky. It looks great. Um, Pre-orders are up today. And... Uh, we, this is the other piece of news we got, is that uh, Nintendo is making the move to $70 video games. Tears of the Kingdom will be the first. Um, no other ones confirmed to be at that price point. In fact, Pikmin 4 is sticking at $60. I think Nintendo is following the same rule as everyone else, which is $70 for the games they know people will buy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and $60 or $50 for the ones they're less sure about, which is why Pikmin 4 is $60 and Tears of the Kingdom is $70. I did secure a $60 pre-order like five minutes before it got pulled off of Best Buy. And so far, Best Buy is honoring that. So we'll see. Uh, but yeah, Tears of the Kingdom. May 12th, New Zelda. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it. I didn't find it to be like a hugely mind-blowing trailer. I mean, it looked nice. Um, I, the thing I am most curious about is the vehicle stuff that like, you know, they didn't give any context for it. So it's hard to tell. Is that a thing where there are like specific bespoke vehicles in the world that you get access to almost like, like the horses or whatever, or there was the fucking that motorcycle or whatever in the DLC, or... Is it Banjo and Kazooie nuts and bolts style where you make your own vehicle? <laughs> um, because they they looked so fucking weird and kind of modular that if that's what it is and they just put a whole vehicle customization thing with a physics engine and all that kind of shit in Breath of the Wild, that would be the thing that would actually make me interested in the game, honestly. As someone who is kind of middle on uh, the original Breath of the Wild. If you just put in like a, yeah, fuck it. Like, yeah, like, let me make a helicopter that has seven wheels on it for no reason and shit like that. And have like the physics bug out with it. Like, that sounds fucking cool. I do not know if that's what they're doing, but there's a glimmer of hope that they're going to make that, that that's like a system thing and not just a sort of class of vehicle that exists in the world. You are not the only person to observe that, by yes. the way. There are other people yeah. who were... I saw a lot of Nuts and Bolts fans on Twitter coming out of the woodwork for this, but yes. Uh, one other thing we noticed in this trailer that my brother picked up on is that it looks like in the story, Link's arm gets like mm -hmm. ruined by the corruption and that the Sheikah Slate, which was the big thing you used in the original game, has been replaced by functions on his arm. And Sh Thomas is playing Sekiro right now, the FromSoft game. And he was joking to, with me, it looks like Link is getting his Shinobi prosthetic. And I laughed very hard at the idea of Link in Sekiro. Uh, but it does, basically that is what we're getting, effectively. I just don't think it will be as graphic as what FromSoft would do. Yes, and then there's also, at the end of the trailer, you see what looks like it's like a continuation of what is the announcement trailer for the game of Link and Zelda in some sort of underground sarcophagus or whatever, um, like tomb, um, yeah. with like a, the mummified corpse of Ganondorf. But then Zelda falls down this pit, and Zelda or Link reaches out to her with his corrupted hand. Um, that I wonder if this is going to be... Um, what the fuck was that game? The modern, the modern, uh, like remake or whatever of Bionic Commando were part of the plot of that game for the 360 era was that the main character's wife was turned into an AI and put into his robot arm. And so he's got a wife arm and maybe that's, maybe you have a Zelda arm and maybe Zelda's consciousness is trapped in your weird robot arm. Um, maybe Zelda is the one who annoys you in this Zelda game instead of, you know, uh, the fairy or the woman from Skyward Sword or any of those characters. Yeah, it's just Zelda constantly saying, hey, listen, and you just like, shut up, arm. I get it. No, I know my arm, my weird wife arm. <laughs> All right. Well, The Legend of Zelda Weird Wife Arm comes out May 12th. <laughs> it has a collector's edition. I was disappointed because the collector's edition for the first game was so fucking great. It came with a Nintendo Switch case that I still use every day of my life. It's a Sheikah State slate carrying case. That is what I keep my Switch in. Um, I've seen that thing every day for six years. Uh, this is just an art book and a steel book. Blech. I don't know why anyone. They should is have given you a sick arm sleeve that yes. looks like his robot arm. Um, I don't. It's <laughs> not, obviously not as useful. Um, that's like a very sort of like serendipitous thing for a, like marketing promotional merchandising tie-in for the first game maybe yeah. the opportunity isn't as obvious for this one but you know they could they could sell you you know they could make it like tens of thousands of dollars and sell you a weird cubular like cube truck thingy um that looks <laughs> like the truck from the game that's also an opportunity they could have uh used. you know i 
I live in Iowa. There's definitely some people who would buy the Zelda themed John Deere tractor. Let's do it. Yeah, Come with on. like weird blue LEDs all over it to make it look like it's a magical <laughs> fucking artifact. Yes. But anyway, this was an active Nintendo Direct. They yep. launched the day of this Direct Metroid Prime Remastered, the Game Boy Games app, the GBA Games app, Wave 2 of the Fire Emblem DLC, Octopath Traveler 2 demo, Kirby demo, and Sea of Stars demo. You could get all of that just out of this Direct. Uh, most of that, a lot of that being free or with existing subscriptions. So pretty fucking good Direct. And again, I just... Let me, you know, make the pitch again for Metroid Prime. If you have never played Metroid Prime, if you are in any way intimidated by it being like an old masterpiece, you need to play Metroid Prime. It is one of the best games ever made. If you are one of the many, many people into Dark Souls and Elden Ring and that kind of lineage, Metroid Prime is one of the single most influential games on that style of game. If you like Dark Souls, I can virtually guarantee you will enjoy things about Metroid Prime. Um, it is it's my second favorite game of all time. I'm enjoying the hell out of it. This is as good a version as you could hope for. Uh, please fucking buy that so we get more Metroid shit. I, you know, my my dream is that Metroid Prime sold fine in its day, but I actually looked back and was shocked. Its lifetime sales were only three million copies. Let's let's beat that for Metroid Prime Remastered because that is totally possible on the Nintendo Switch, and it would make yes. me laugh very hard. So uh, yeah, I love me some Metroid, and uh, so I was a happy camper. Yeah, no, this is definitely, like, the most action-packed Nintendo Direct I feel like they've had in a long time. It does, like, and, you know, they specifically, this is often what they do with the Nintendo Directs, where they focused it on what is coming out in the near future. But it is, I think, an open question at this point. We're late enough in the Switch's lifetime, and enough of, like, the big titles that, like, had been, we had known about that were in development forever, like Bayonetta 3, like Shin Megami Tensei 5 like um, Legend of Zelda, uh, Tears of the Kingdom, which is, will be out soon. Um, th those are all, those games are out or about to come out. Metroid Prime 4 is still a an open question, but it does, like, it, there was something about this that made it feel like, oh, I think we're getting pretty close, relatively speaking, to the end of the Switch. Like, it, I'm, like they are certainly the first party studios for Nintendo. I'm guessing we're going to have, like, one or two other things that we don't know about yet that are going to come out for the Switch, but I bet that those studios are now on designing games for whatever the successor to the switch is because there's not there wasn't anything in here that was like here's something to look forward to past the current like event horizon of the switch's release schedule right there wasn't something like that where you're like oh here's you can feel the distant future of switch releases still out there i feel like it's like this at the end of lots of console cycles where you get like oh you can kind of feel that there's a black curtain or something a year to two years out and past there is where your Switch 2 releases are. Yeah, it, it, and from reporting, it sounds like there was at one point a thought of maybe doing a Switch Pro kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That the, the, the pandemic and chip shortages and also the Switch continuing to sell like gangbusters without new hardware just kind of push that aside. And it seems like the Switch 2 has effectively like absorbed whatever that would be. And it sounds like, you know, from the little details we have, I, I assume the Switch 2 will be sort of like the Nintendo 3DS in that it carried every, over everything the DS could do, mm -hmm. but then had new stuff. Um, and of course, I'm on board for that. I don't, I don't know why Nintendo would change strategy now. If anything, I'm baffled why, like, PlayStation and Xbox aren't getting in on portable gaming right now, given the wild success of the Switch and the Steam Deck and everything. Um, but yeah. They've, they're clearly in a good groove, but yes, I think it, it seems likely that all of Nintendo's resources behind the scenes are probably going into software for the successor to the Switch, whenever that will be. Again, its, it's sales have not slowed down in the way you would see from a late console, like they are still struggling to meet demand. So, you know, we'll see. But it's uh, it's an interesting uh, junction in the in the lifespan of the system. Yeah. I mean, we are, you know, obviously the sales are still incredibly good, but I do think we are past that curve. Like, we are in the sure. late stage of the sales. It's just like, kind of like the PS2, that late stage looks a lot different than it does for most yes. consoles, right? Um, yeah. So it's like, it's still selling incredibly well, but I do think we are over that hump now. Um, I think we hit that hump like a year to, to, to two years ago at this point where they're starting to get like 
it's their growth has slowed and they're selling less than they did the previous year in the similar in the same quarter that's you're seeing that more consistently now with the switch so i think it's like we are hitting that point where they they're going to put out whatever that sequel is whatever whatever all it takes i think it will have to be like you it's got to be like a 3ds-esque just normal continuation like Xbox One to series or like PS4 to PS5, it would be fucking insanity if they just decided to do a Wii esque. We're just gonna fucking go crazy and just do something totally different. Uh, this, you know, maybe after the Switch Two might be a good idea to do that, but it, I would be utterly flabbergasted if if Nintendo tried to completely shift gears um, after what the Switch has done. All I can say is it better have an OLED screen on par with what is on the Switch OLED right now because I am spoiled by that thing. It is. Honestly, it's my favorite way to play any games right now. That OLED screen is so stupidly gorgeous. I can't believe it's on a Nintendo device. I do not associate the Nintendo with having tech that good. Um, It's wild to me. The last time a piece of Nintendo tech was this nice was probably, like, relative to the rest of the industry, was probably the DS Lite. And I remember when the DS Lite came out and everyone was like, Nintendo made this? Really? The GameCube people and the people who made that original ugly clamshell DS made this Apple-looking thing? Wow, that is how I feel about the Switch OLED. It looks so fucking good. It looks nicer than my TV. Um, so they better they just they better keep that up. That's all. But if they give you the really nice OLED version at launch, how are they going to sell you the OLED version three years later for fifty more dollars <laughs> than you bought the original one? Yeah, who knows? Uh, and and again, it's the other report that seems like not confirmed, but I think everyone assumes is true, is that the OLED Switch was like. <laughs> the Switch Pro minus all the other things that would have made it Pro. Uh, And again, I am happy because it is such a nice upgrade if you play handheld, but yeah, um, we'll see. I wonder if the, the, whatever the Switch Pro was going to be was, would have been $350. And then most of what goes into that additional $50 they threw out and they're like, but we don't actually have to lower the price, huh? And they're like, let's let's just leave it. Like, let's just leave it at 350. There's no reason. (laughs) There's no reason not to. (laughs) It's uh, but I, you know, we are at a point now where I have this hand, this beautiful handheld with this amazing OLED screen. I can play all the Persona games on it. I'm playing visual novels on it. It's got all these indie games. I feel like the PS Vita died and was reborn in the body of the Nintendo Switch, and it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to see. I love that the Vita in death has been like fully vindicated uh, as a project, and I really, I have to say. I think looking back, there's going to be a point where a lot of people are going to be baffled why Sony put a lot of money into making the PSVR and not the Vita 2. That's all uh, I can say. I don't think so. Like, I think, like, because this is something that I saw kind of being discussed. And I think the the trick is you can't do the PS5 and the PS Vita 2. That doesn't do the Switch, right? You need You would need something that, like, does the Switch thing where you're putting out one lineup of games. Right that both works handheld and both works on console, and you can't have the PS5 be that thing also. You know, it wouldn't be cost-efficient. Because the do Steam, you want to pay Steam Deck $800 play for your fucking Switch handheld thing? Like, I, I, Sean, personally, I wouldn't for PlayStation stuff. I think the Steam Deck is an interesting example of, like, people will do it, though. Like... And and I mean you can play God of War on your fucking Steam Deck, not Ragnarok. Yeah, yet, you can't but... you can't play Ratchet and Clank, whatever the new one was called. I can't remember the subject. Right, but that's right. the only like PS5 exclusive on that thing. So yes, but if for the coming future, right? You can right. like I think that's the thing is like you can do the previous generation and have it be relatively cost effective. You can't do if you're trying to push the tech in the main console sure. space. That's not going to work. Like I think the. You know, I think I think like what this works out for the market in general is really nice of like Nintendo gets to have that space to itself and be really successful. And then Xbox a little bit like less so than PlayStation, but it, you know, but particularly PlayStation and then Steam gets to be very successful in this more we're focused more on the power where like the big third parties, you know, where the where you go to get Grand Theft Auto and Call of Duty and that kind of stuff. Um, like that's its own successful business strategy. Nintendo has its uh, business strategy with its first parties. Like, I don't think Sony, if Sony tried to chase that um, and tried to chase the Nintendo thing, I don't think it would work for them. I think the Vita kind of proved that. I I broadly agree. I was mostly making a joke. Um, And I do think it works. I just, you know, I am curious where, like, I think it works nicely. 
I do think I'm curious how long everyone else will want to have Nintendo have that market on its own is all I'm curious yeah. about. But, you know, so. but Sony makes more revenue on their game stuff than Nintendo does. Like, they don't make more on their first party games, but Grand Theft Auto V has sold 175 million copies. Right. <laughs> that is the most recent number that came out, right? So it's like, I think that's the, the third party strategy for Sony and Xbox is very lucrative for them in a very different way than Nintendo's strategy is lucrative. And I think if either of them tried to go for the other, like if Nintendo tried to push the tech stuff and really went for that and wanted to get all the third party stuff on there, or Sony wanted to try to push into the portable space and compromise that sort of like cutting edge thing that they've got, I think both of them would be less successful. Like I think that's a little bit of what we saw like kind of work out in that early 3D generations where we had like the PS2 and the GameCube and then Nintendo having to go off and experiment in its own space has worked for it because it's because I don't think there's room for three consoles all fighting for those third party um, game revenue and stuff like that. I mean, there's barely room for two as yes. we're seeing with, yeah. with Xbox. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Anything else to say before we sign off for today, Sean? It was, you know, Nintendo's doing good shit. It was a good direct. Yep. yep. All right. Uh, we will see you guys next week for whatever we will talk about then. Uh, be sure to follow the premiere of Japanimation Station, uh, which, uh, if you're listening to this on the day Weekly Stuff comes out, will be tomorrow. It'll be February 14th, 7 p.m. on YouTube for the premiere, or midnight on all podcast platforms, wherever you want to listen to it. Uh, be there, be square. It's going to be good. Yeah, go watch the first two. Oh, wait, no. Do we need to, What is in our first episode? Is it the first Our first episode movies? is parts one and two of yes. Garden of Sinners. Yes. Yes. So for the first episode, go watch the first two movies of Garden of Sinners, both of them on Crunchyroll. Um, and and come join us on Japanimation uh, Station Season 2 because it's a hell of a fucking ride. <laughs>